My name is Stephanie McCallum. I am with Radical Sparkles Child Care Collective. What we do is provide child care, free child care, for social justice outreach events. Um, if you contact us uh, at radical.sparkle.childcare, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not, at gmail.com. Our table's over there. Please feel free to grab a flyer. Um, contact us at the email. We prefer to get at least a month notice, but we can provide free child care for any of your social justice outreach events. Thank you. Thanks for being out here, everyone. It's really a beautiful day as summer changes to fall today. So we're also on the cusp of change. We're bringing social change and consciousness in our just very being here today. Yes or yes? Yes. 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 And call your friends and tell them we got plenty of seats available. <laughs> so our first speaker this morning, uh, our first person coming up on up, is that going to be uh, Sis? way?
unfortunately, Rose has Hi. just introduced me to Jason. Jason, do you want to tell me something about who you are and what you do here? Uh, well, I am known as Jason the Green Resourcer at your service, and uh, uh, I am the facilities director here at the Eco Village Training Center, uh, also one of the research fellows and teachers. And uh, I do have some research and development going on in different areas that um, have to do with uh, energy and alternative um, power and things like that. Yeah. And uh, I've got a whole laboratory we could we could cut to, and you could see some of the basic examples, educational versions of um, patents that I am replicating that um, are going to turn the the world of uh, energy as we know it sort of upside down, so we can understand what's really going on. Yeah. So is that the thing that's given you the most juice or what's what? Yeah, uh, pretty much. That's my, that's the forte that I, I mean, there's all kinds of other things that I have to deal with, plumbing and electrical and painting and, you know, all this kind of stuff to keep things going and facilitating and hosting and this kind of thing. But when it gets down to it, you know, I, I do a lot of things where I repair golf carts for people and stuff like that. But the cutting edge of what I'm doing has to do with reinventing the electric motor and the battery. Uh -huh. and so that's that's kind of in a nutshell. So we're going to get over to your lab to see some of this. Sure. Great. Thank you, Jason. What's your last? What's your full name? Jason Deptula. And and you've been here on the farm for how long? Almost 13 years. Uh huh. Thanks. We're going to go inside some of these buildings. What, what this is looks like this it's is, um, you've got stuff bales. growing on top of the house. Yeah, see the the we have an earth roof system that we've developed here that um, provides air conditioning in the summertime and uh, helps restore the balance between the sky and the earth, you know, wherever there's a building so that it's not just reflecting all the energy right back to the sky, it's actually absorbing it and causing things to grow and makes the, the building quite comfortable. Um, evaporative cooling effect goes right into the room under the roof. So, um, And they're real pretty to look at. We're inspired by uh, the Shire and the Hobbits and all that kind of thing. So uh -huh. that's the Green Dragon is the, the big building there. Um, you can see the dragon on the roof there. Sort of inspired by the, uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And, but really, the, it's a... That's a student-built natural building out of all kinds of different natural materials and techniques that we're teaching to people all over the world for those who can't or won't or don't go to Home Depot and Lowe's for everything they need. Say that again. What is? What are you insulating this with? The building is insulated with a mixture of straw and clay slip. Uh, it's an old German method called light straw clay slip. And uh, you stuff it in between the cavities of the wall and the forms, take the forms off, let it cure, and then put an earthen plaster over it. And uh, you end up with a real nice, smooth, straight wall. Uh, ours will be 12 inches thick. It'll be an R36 or so. Sift it out. So um, this is the clay sip in here. It's a lot of rainwater in there now, but so this is just the clay it's from the under clay our feet. Step. and. So, uh, you know, a scoop of this, when it's just the right, you know, stirred up in the right consistency, um, gets tossed over a couple of flakes of straw, and then it gets um, stuffed in the walls, which there's a bunch, bunch of it in progress here, so you can kind of see the see before it. and the after. Great. Do straw clay slip because it actually deals with the humidity better and gives you a much smoother surface to plaster when you're done. You have a wall that's actually straight and doesn't have all these little pockets and corners sticking out where the straw bales are shaped funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are straw bales we're packing in and they'll put the clay slip over that and it ends up being just a really beautiful surface like you can see over here it's already <clears throat> finished over here they're working on it here trying to get it finished up but see how beautiful it looks when it's done it's just absolutely breathtaking I think. In here, they're using um, this technique of using the wood, the cut wood pieces, and glass bottles in a decorative way, sort of free form. The different process. This is a really good teaching tool, and of course, we use this as a, you know, I'm sure they use this as a meeting place this weekend when they had 30 people here visiting. So it's going to be um, good. 
great. It's going to be dorms. There's never enough places to stay here on the farm. So even A few bedrooms down here. This is a replication of John Bedini's simplified schoolgirl circuit for um, the battery charger. It, um, it takes the, the back EMF forces that this little motor creates and uses that to charge other batteries. So it runs on one battery, consumes about between one and three watts of power, and during that time causes the other battery at the other end of the circuit to charge itself, not from those three watts, but from radiant energy that is attracted to the battery as a result of the circuit and the process that's taking place here. So I'll just give it a little spin, and it'll start accelerating, and then uh, this battery, I got a voltmeter hooked to it, and this was sitting at, this is an 18 volt battery, and uh, the numbers are climbing, 1984, 86, 87, 88, 89, 1990, so once this gets up to about 21 volts, it'll be fully charged, I can take it and go, you know, make something with it, with the battery energy. And if I were to measure the energy coming out of this battery during its use, it would add up to more energy than what actually um, was consumed in running this motor. And I have a motor, so this could be a fan or a pump or something as well. So I've got, um, and I didn't invent this, it's just uh, a patent. The U.S. granted a patent for this device in 2004, so it's still valid and it's nothing hocus pocus about this at all. Um, if the cat's out of the bag, that there are ways of triggering energy to attract itself to a system. In this case, um, these little batteries. I could scale this up to a charger big enough or a motor big enough to run a car. And eventually we'll get there. We'll start off with a bicycle and then move up to you know, a scooter or a motorcycle or something like that. And uh -huh. Maybe a lawnmower. And one thing at a time, get this sort of perfected and scaled up to the point where um, I teach people how to do it. I'm, not going to make the mistake of, hey, everybody, you want to buy my free energy device because that wouldn't last long. Um, it's not, not fit for our uh, paradigm. Right. But this is introducing a new paradigm. This will give way to the old. Yeah. When uh, devices no longer need an energy input, they can just charge themselves. So, wait a minute. You, I, I saw that you are a resourcer, and, uh -huh. uh, and I love that title. But you're using less energy to create more energy. Yes, where this gizmo is. Just like um, a solar panel or a heat pump would do, the solar panel uses the sun as another source of energy. The heat pump uses the ambient temperature of the air around it as another source of energy. This device uses the radiant virtual photon flux of the vacuum as another source of energy. It's engineering the vacuum into a steady state flow into the battery. Um, electronic engineers, electrics people never were taught that they were taught that the, the energy in the vacuum is inert and not available. And so this is radiant reactive power that has been converted for practical use. So that energy is there, everyone calls it static electricity and other names like lightning and stuff like that. But um, our industry has never really made an effort to capture and harness and use that energy. It's always been um, discarded as you know, energy that can't be dealt with. And so Nikola Tesla over 130 years ago understood about this and had many patents dealing with this, but we only know him for mainly as AC power, all the actual yeah. right. AC power in the world he invented. So, um, But he did some other stuff too, and we're picking up where uh, some of those threads were he left off and, and uh, trying to help uh, the situation out. Wow, that is well, so cool, Jason. Good on you, Jason, and all of you who are working on this. Maybe, you know, as we have a good friend who refers to us as creating the new society in the shell of the old, mm -hmm. that uh, is a great example of, yep. of shells of old cars of this, looks like an old bicycle That's right. tire wheel. And, uh, and thanks for your creativity. You're welcome. You're That's much needed. Help our world continue. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Tell us this. This is a little little <laughs> story or understanding of the farm. So oh, there are there. there are people like you. Okay. So so wait a minute. So Rose, you're a recent person who's come. Right, to I came the farm. here two years ago. And because I'm well, I married a farmy who was also 
came only came here eight years ago. So we came here of our free will because we really wanted to be here and contribute to the community. Um, but we're not the original people that came from San Francisco. Yeah. Um, so then, then there's you, Jason, who uh, who couldn't have come here originally because right. you're not old enough. Right. I'm the same age as the people that were born here, the first generation of folks that were born here. And so people of my age that grew up here are called the second generation because they they were born here and by the hippies who came here as you know, the first generation. But we have a total of four generations living here now because uh, the parents of the hippies are now having their last years here. And, and uh, there's uh, my daughter is 12 years old and people her age are considered third generation. But since I came here, and my parents didn't, I came here later, I'm... You know, it's kind of confusing. I'm really a first-generation hippie for this place, and and uh, but it, you know, it just gets it's just a bunch of terminology, really. You know, so, <laughs> there's there's uh, so yes, we have four generations. There's four generations in the cemetery as we speak. So it's right. all together. You know, um, it's it's a it's a village that keeps on growing. So so whatever brought you here, and what keeps you here? Um, well, I think it has to do with um, the um, the culture. Uh, the, the, the there's a the, the 70s seventies countercultural movement, you know, f is is still alive and well in certain places, and this is one of them. And uh, I, I resonate with that and all of the aspects of it, of the lifestyle. And um, I feel like I'm in a place with plenty of people of like mind, and not just one weirdo out in the woods all by himself wondering what's wrong with himself because he's, nobody else is like him, you know. So I come here and I feel a kinship. And, uh, exactly. And so that's so that's what keeps me here. So I'd rather be around folks that think the way I do, and, and that's quite a natural phenomenon. So there's not too many of us around, but they're everywhere. But this is one of the places that's slightly more concentrated. Okay. Thanks. Okay, now... Rose, where, where are we and what is this? Well, we're in the Eco Village Training Center at the farm, and this is a solar shower. You said, what is this building? And it's two little solar showers. This is a solar panel here. And don't ask me how it works, but you know, it's obviously a little solar panel, and this obviously must be some kind of an enhancer or something. But there's two showers, and then around the corner there's a solar bathroom. And it works very well. So, so Jess, you're, what's your role here? And how long have you been here? And what brought you here? And you were at Clark University. How, tell me in, in 30 seconds or more. And what is my role at the farm school? Yeah, so you're at the farm school. Yeah. Um, I teach math to children in the morning. So mostly I stick to math for under seven years old. But I also help with the up to... 12, 13 year old. And then I do admin stuff for the office in here. And so, you know, making sure bills are paid and answering emails and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and then when I'm not at school, I do teach permaculture and I organize and do event coordinating for permaculture courses and uh, natural building courses and homesteading courses and regenerative earthworks, you name it. We course on it or we're creating one and yeah it's fun <laughs> so it certainly sounds like it so uh when we started talking you said you had you were you were in massachusetts you had been in school and uh, and, and all my did, stuff is still in massachusetts in and, storage <laughs> and how did you find this place um i took, decided to take a break from clark um and so i threw everything into storage and i was going to do a six month road trip i took yeah i was going to take one semester off and um, and I wanted to go visit farms and intentional communities, and so I was woofing. The, uh, and so I stopped at one farm, and I was woofing, and then I stopped at another one, and then I came to. I was like, I'm gonna check this this one. Oh my goodness! You got a big O on your face. No, it's a mustache. It's a mustache. It's a goatee. What is it? A mustache. Oh, very good. <laughs> Way to go, girlfriend. Um, but yeah, so I threw everything into storage, 
started, oh, and then I was, I was like, oh, I'm going to go visit this place called The Farm, and I was going to just visit a bunch of intentional communities, and I was actually on my way to New Zealand to go woof throughout there and visit communities and see what communities are like in the other side of the world. Um, but I got to The Farm, and I met one person, and I, I said, he said, well, why did you leave school? And I said, because I was just bogged down with all the problems of the world. I was doing environmental toxicology and environmental policy, and I was reading about what things do to the body. I like your necklace. That's beautiful. I like it. Is it a diamond? Is it a pearl? Is it Play-Doh? Is it a dog collar? Are you a dog right now? <laughs> Aha! Good puppy. Frog collar? Because now you're kind of sitting like a frog. Somebody who I, I said, I said, well, what he said, why didn't you leave school? And I said, because I'm just bogged down with all the problems of the world, and I'm, you know, academia is not giving me solutions. And he said, well, like what? And I said, well, for example, we have all this lead in the in the soil, and it's getting into our food, and we're eating it, and it's doing this to the body and that to the body. And how do we get the lead out? We just keep adding more lead. How do we get it out? And he goes, oh, well, that's easy. You plant such and such plant, and it takes it right out. Oh. Okay, well, what about the cadmium? Oh, well, you can plant this, and that gets it out. Well, why weren't they teaching me that in school? I went there to find solutions, and I just kept giving, being given more problems. So I got here, and I learned about permaculture, and I found all about solution-based living. And I threw everything out. I didn't go to New Zealand. I decided to stay here, and I did apprenticed with him. And then I, I sat there and I go, okay, I'm gonna go back to school, what am I gonna do? And then I heard that the innkeeper position opened up here, so I came back to the farm and I just left everything in storage and now here it is three years later. <laughs> and I haven't gone back for my stuff. I bought land right off the farm. I think I'm here. <laughs> so yeah, now I gotta get my stuff down here. Yeah. But so, so what made you decide to buy land off the farm instead of coming to live on the farm? I lived on the farm for about two and a half years and um, there's certain things, I don't know how familiar you are with permaculture, um, but there's certain things that permaculture advocates that the farm doesn't. And so there's the 10 ideals to living on the farm, which are great ideals. Um, but they don't quite coexist with permaculture fully. Um, and so, for example, you can't cut down a tree on the farm, and permaculture believes that once man interferes with, with uh, the woods, it's man's responsibility to restore the woods and to help it restore itself. And so, so the farm says, well, you can't da cut down any of the woods. Permaculture says, you need to go in and selectively harvest to build that canopy up and to make the root structure stronger and to you know, promote understory growth and things like that. So, you know, it's just little things uh -huh. that are slightly different that I want to be able to do that I can't do on the farm, but yet I just I adore the community and I see that there's huge benefits to being yes. involved in the greater farm family. And so I stuck around um, and we do all of our stuff out there and, and I'm... I'm a meat eater, and I can't raise my own chickens, and I don't want to support factory farms. I don't want to support that food system. I want to be able to be independent and grow my own food, but I know that my body really needs meat. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. The techniques that she taught the kids, and I think they turned out really well, so I did mine, I did mine there. It's not quite finished, but it's, it's not bad, I guess. Um, but this this is one of the things that kids love doing. And we have we have outdoor very hard mm -hmm. houses. We have an outdoor week where we just spend the whole week out in the woods and we build teepees and we do um, forest art and we made these fairy houses last year. Dina's art class made these, and she just used hot glue 
and used old pieces of cardboard to glue, really make in little interesting little fairy houses. This is one of the special projects that I taught the kids and where we carved. We used, um, we used these top, we carved red um, tile. These have been um, in the kiln once and um, we will um, glaze these with the turquoise glaze and um, we're going to install them on the wall. Wonderful. So, so here you are in school at the farm school in Summertown, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And do you want to tell me your name? Oh, my name's Karuna. And, and you've been in school here since when? Um, since second grade, and this is my senior year. Uh huh. And, and what do you think is, is particularly special about here, about this school? Um, that you are encouraged to be an individual. It's not about, it's not just about, like, you know. It's not just about the education, it's about getting to be yourself. Uh-huh. So. Yeah. And, and you're a student here too? Mm -hmm. and, but you don't live here on the farm? No. And so how did, what made you choose to come to school here? Um, it was public school reasons. Uh-huh. I couldn't really do anything without getting in trouble. So uh -huh. I decided to come here. And so what's your name? Sky. Sky, so so um, so you're doing the same things I expect here that you were doing in public school, and you're not getting in trouble. No. What's the difference? Um, there aren't as many restrictions. Uh huh. Like piercings and stuff, I couldn't have these in public school. Uh huh. But I can here. Yeah. So so what Karuna was saying about the in, you're encouraged to be an individual to really be yourself, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that. It's not exactly what my experience at public school is. And, uh, and so you're enjoying it? Or do you think you're learning anything here? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Great. So, uh, so you're a senior. Are you a senior too? Mm -hmm. So what are, you, what are you thinking of doing when this year's over? Um, well, I want to take a year off to um, focus on dancing. Uh -huh. And then I want to go to college to be a teen therapist. Excellent. Great. And how about you, Sky? Um, I want to go to school for photography. Photography. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And do you do a lot of photography here? Mm -hmm. Already. So you're doing an apprenticeship and really learning about photography before you enroll in a school. Yeah. Good. So any, any other comments to, uh, to people who will be watching this in other parts of the country? I have no idea. I mean, this is a really awesome school. I, I don't know what else. To say about it. Yeah. And. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Yeah. We're sitting in the in the farm store having lunch with Jordan from New York City. Jordan from New York City, and Jordan, you're here because you're in the midwifery assistant course. Uh huh. So um, this week we are learning all the techniques and so forth to aid midwives during labor. So I'm already familiar with birth because I'm a doula and I've been a doula, a birth doula for three years now. So I'm familiar with helping women through labor, but not so much the medical aspect, which is kind of what we're learning more throughout the course of um, this program. And this is a weekend course? This is a this one? This is a, a week-long course. A week-long so, course. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we'll be here for the remainder of the week. For example, this morning we studied um, bloodborne pathogens, um, how to have the proper do the proper protocols um, during labor, to set how to um, what um, supplies are needed, how to set up birth supplies and so forth. And then today we're going to practice on sterilizing uh, birth supplies and things like that. So we're going to be doing that at the midwifery clinic, which is kind of further down.
being mostly a hospital based doula and so um, I actually was talking to Ina May when she was in New York and um, telling her kind of more of what I was looking for and so she told me she encouraged me to take the class um, down here and so I tried to do it last year and it, it books up really fast <laughs> so um, I think in February I, or March I was like I'm looking to take that class in the summer and like okay we're all full for the summer but we are okay for September I was like alright I've lived in Tennessee before so I know that the summer can get really hot <laughs> so, the right time. I came at the right time so that was pretty hot today so here's Plenty. Don Plenty was uh, in 76 in Guatemala and they came back and told us how sweet people they were now, Plenty is what? Do you Plenty want to International, just... it's the group that the farm started previous to that. As a Well, I, when, when we went to Guatemala, it was then International Relief. Before that, it was localized. Making and, uh, sure the people got fed yeah. and clothing and were taken care of. But anyway, my own personal story, I never got to go on that project. So and when, when was years, that? That was 76. Uh -huh. For 30 years, I was interested because of the, what I'd heard about the people. And I studied and I read... A lot of stuff about Guatemala, about the horrible violence from seven, from when we were there. We had to leave because they were leaving a body. They left a body at our camp as a message oh dear. that we were making it dangerous for people, other people, and for us. And we had to pull out. And the best project Plenty ever had: ten schools, three hundred homes, and a community center for indigenous people was built. You so know, now this is the one that started in seventy six. Seventy six, seventy seven, and then we had to get That's out of there. The, the, uh, the earthquake was in 74, All right, 75 and, then, and then they hitchhiked down in 75 and found the Mennonites, who had a whole bunch of material, didn't know what to do with, and so a bunch of our carpenters went down and some of our midwives and health people and just started working with the folks down there and built all those city centers and, and uh, schools and some homes and helped to put in water systems. And then when they started putting in radios was when it got a little dangerous. Yeah, yeah we thought it would be great because then they didn't have but one telephone on the lake. Mm -hmm. And there was like 14 villages and they, you had to go to Solo La, I think, to use the telephone. So we thought, oh, CB radios, this is a great idea, perfect, all around the lake. And we had them all around the lake. And then we realized that that was subversive to let the Indians have radios in a war zone. And Doug Stevenson, actually walked all the way around the lake, went to each place, took the radio and threw it in the lake, and then walked to the next town, took the radio and threw it in the lake. You're kidding. Just and, ahead of the army, because people would have got lives. killed over that, you know? Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. And I'm pretty sure people got killed over putting in a water system as a collective. Uh -huh. Who, who business put this in, you know? You did it you, as a group, a collective? That's communist. Mm -hmm. Right. Killed them. So anyway, what I was going to tell you is, was three years ago I went for the first time, and I was going for Spanish immersion, Spanish language immersion, and I forgot about that it would also be cultural immersion, and that was the heavy part, and the people are sweet to this day. The culture, the way it looks to me is the mothers are awesome. The mothers transmit the culture. They raise babies loved and secure, and you know, so that the baby can grow to his full potential. You need that as a baby. You know, you need the perfect environment. And those mothers, I mean, they're all about it. The young girls that are that are wearing traje, their own clothes, stay virgin until they're ready to, until they are married and ready to have a baby because this is what they want. My teacher told me, you know. <laughs> and my wife hasn't been there yet, but I'm certain the first time she goes down, she's going to fall in love just like I did because mm -hmm. she is a midwife. And when she sees the mother-child connection and just how beautiful the young ladies are because they're just so sweet and nice. I think, you know, being sexually liberated like we are is not necessarily a good idea mm -hmm. uh -huh. for family and, and all that, you know. And they have a different way, and it, it looks good. The girls are just so pretty down there. Mm -hmm. So sweet. I mean, my teacher was 28, and I was wondering about this, and so she started telling me about it, about her first boyfriend and how that didn't work and how she's been with this other guy for eight years. And uh, <clears throat> she, when, I, when we were together, closer than this, doing our 
class, four hours a day, we'd sit, you know, and talk Spanish. And she would smile at me so much, so many times. I don't know why all it was, but she just really laid it on me, you know, just socked it to me. Then we'd go to the break, and she'd sit back, and she was just normal and ordinary, and didn't look outstanding or anything, you know. And then we got back together, and she'd light up again, you know. So she's, they're wise to what they have and how to use it. You know, they don't just go flaunting their beauty everywhere and trying to, you know, attract a lot of attention. So, anyway, Guatemala has a history goes back 5,000 years. The Mayans are still the majority in Guatemala, 60% as mm -hmm. Mayans, and they don't have any power for a number of reasons, but one of them is the Catholic Church and the Evangelical Church have got each got large groups of them. The Evangelicals side with the government. They sided with the government during the what they call the Civil War because it was safer. If you were evangelical, you might not get killed in a massacre or you know you might be able to get away. Mm. So the evangelicals overtook the Catholic Church during that period because that was this you know, they were they played with the government and they're still playing with the government and it means the Mayans don't have any authority even though they're a majority of the population. They could be running the country. But they're not. And they may never. But recently there was just a trial of Rios Mont. Yes. You heard about that? Yeah. A lot of people were very disappointed because after two or three months of testimony and a conviction, a couple of days later it was overturned by a higher court. Mm -hmm. Now Alan Nairn, who is supposed to be one of the witnesses who worked with Amy Goodman all these years, he said, no, this is an epic moment in history. Never before, when the people still had the guns, did they ever allow a trial to go on. For the Nazis, they had to lose first, you know. Mm -hmm. Never in, in history has the people that still had the power allowed a trial, even though it was cut off. All that evidence went out there on the, in the media for two or three months, you know, and it was a lot of people telling true stories. Rios Mont had to sit and listen to it all. He's 80 years old, you know, I don't care whether he's in prison or not, but. And the president, at one point, when, when Alan Nairn was gonna testify, the president said, as my name comes up in this trial, it's over. And that's one of the reasons Alan didn't testify, because he got it, he's got him on video. He's got the president back when, in the 80s sometime, or maybe it was the 70s, in the Highlands, with dead people at his feet. And He's got blood on his hands, and he's the president of Guatemala. So, so it's, here's an interesting thing culturally in Guatemala. The Mayans are as sweet a people as you can find, is that, that I know of. But it's the most violent country in the Americas, or it's, it's, very, it's like Mexico is coming close now. And the reason is, I think, they had this horrible war. People were trained at the SOA. They were trained... You maintain the status quo. If you have to rape, torture, massacre, it's okay. You can do it with impunity. You're the good guys, and we told them. So you got thousands of soldiers that are mass murderers and rapists and torturers. All right, war's over. Turn them loose. Yeah. And they become extortionists and drug lords and, you know, and they kill people. They've got this bad habit. So in a country where the real base of the people and the culture is very kind and Really, communitarian is what the Guatemalans are. They think of their community first. And uh, they're in a horrible place. There was a, a murder in, in San Pedro, which is a real nice, mellow town, you know, and nobody knew what, who, who did it. A young boy was tortured and thrown in the lake while I was there. I was actually in Guatemala City at the time. <clears throat> so, I love to go down and be with the Mayans and see what I can do to help out, which, you know, little ideas like the, the edamame, and last time I showed four groups of women how to make tempe, which is another way to get soybeans edible without going through all the mess of making milk and tofu and all that, so. Yeah. Beautiful place, and I was talking about the immersion school. You yeah. get 20 hours a week with a teacher, four hours, five days a week, one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. You get room and board with a Spanish-speaking family. All that is 160 bucks a week. Room wow. and board, and that's cool. Plus, you get every evening there's some extracurricular. There's a salsa lessons, or there's a Spanish movie, or something. So it's an incredible. I mean, 
The first time I went for three weeks, I could barely sleep. I'd go to bed and one o'clock I'd wake up. I was so excited. You were so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'd take a long walk, you know, maybe get another hour of sleep before the sun came up. But then I realized when I went back, I'm going to have to make sure that I meditate while I'm here because I can't just be this excited and it's not good for you. <laughs> you got sleeping, you know. But it's, it's a thrilling place to be. Where I was especially in San Pedro on Lake Atitlan, which is an incredibly beautiful place. Volcanoes around it, you know. Three volcanoes on the south side. Lake Atitlan, you can see all three of them from a lot of the vantage points. Beautiful I country. I would love to go. Yeah. yeah. This world is Do so it. It's close. There's it's so just so past Mexico, you know. It's the closest incredible country. Incredible stuff in this world. How Couple can we be so cruel cool to it? Get you there one way. And so blind. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. There's enough for everybody. There's no reason to fight. It's so kill. cheap, too. And, and there is, you know. Is this? Climb on.